So, uh, um, you know, I have been a biotechnologist for a long time and then I became a VC uh, about 10 years ago. And, but I'm pretty involved with a few genomics companies now myself. Uh, as, a, as a venture guy, we invested in Garden Health, genomic, uh, uh, Carla Genomics, for example, and a few others. Uh, and, and Centrillion Technologies, for example. Uh, so, so, actually, with uh, uh, Centrillion, I'm, I'm more than involved as an investor, as a board member, and also i currently the chief strategy officer of the company. Um, I'm also uh, working with uh, several entrepreneurs uh, on a bunch of uh, genomics-related startups, uh, including NGS and, and related, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I, I wasn't meant to be up here, but uh, be happy to share my, my experiences with you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the great introduction. Uh, Sophie, yes, uh, BGI, I think, is the best and the largest NGS company in the world. <laughs> Uh, just because you have technology, you have sequencing regions, and you have applications, and you don't hesitate to look around. So thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Nikolai Sergeev. I'm a founder of a company called Altera Bio. Uh, so we are very early stage, but uh, I can tell a little more about myself. So I came to the United States in 2002, and for the first almost five years, I spent uh, working for uh, FDA, uh, more specifically CDRH or IVD. And this actually uh, shaped me up as a scientist. Uh, so I've seen all these great technologies coming on the market. And FDA actually gives you this critical mindset to understand, does it really work? Is it really safe? Does it really serve the purpose? Uh, do you have a claim to support the intended use? And since then, I actually became looking at all these wonderful and exciting technologies, uh, not as a scientist, not only just a scientist, but as an FDA reviewer. Uh, since then, I worked for companies such as Applied Biosystems for five years, and during uh, that time, uh, I actually launched several products at Applied Bio, and they were uh, high-profile products such as Mycoplasma uh, Sample Preparation Kit, uh, which actually solved a problem of, pharma con of uh, Mycoplasma contamination pharmaceutical area. And all big companies now doing it now, so instead of culturing Mycoplasma for 25 days, now you can do it in four hours. I also invented technology which allowed to push uh, limits of uh, qPCR-based detection in a single tube that was patented in US worldwide and European patent. And after applied by systems, I actually switched uh, to next generation sequencing and I actually am uh, the guy who launched Garden uh, 360 in 2014. So my job was to automate and took a true clear validation. And it, this work was presented at ASCO, it was very well taken, another 40 million came uh, to the company. After Garden Health, I uh, spent almost two years at a company called Natera, uh, which is the leading provider of prenatal diagnostic tests in the US and probably very close to worldwide. And during all this time, I was actually learning these technologies from the inside uh, and optimizing them, making sure that I can actually do whatever I can uh, to make these technologies work and really help uh, provide results which actually make sense. And we will talk about precision medicine and that's uh, my key finding, and that's what my motivation to actually start a new company and be able uh, to do things the right way. I would say work on boundaries, not limit yourself to one thing that you know, like CTDNA only for liquid biopsy, no way. Uh, we, uh, there is not enough information there, you need to look at more uh, markets and things like that. So um, I think with that, that would be enough uh, introduction of myself and the company, so I'm giving this to my friend. Hi, my name is Chuan Um I'm, uh, uh, I have lived in the U.S. for over 20 years, and my career mostly in the U.S., but uh, I grew up and get education in China. So if the audience, in the audience, anybody who needs something to be speak, uh, spoken in Chinese, 如果需要讲中文, 我可以随时转成讲中文. Uh, now, uh, so the, the time I, uh, my career part, uh, first of all, I also want to express that uh, this evolving panel, indeed, I was enlisted just within the last 30 minutes, but I'm good friend with um, uh, people like Alex, like Sophie, and also have been working in the industry for over 20 years, so they know me, and uh, while seeing me around, just grab me uh, to substitute, so that's not a problem. I, I'm very happy uh, on this panel because 
precision medicine and NGS is really what I'm currently doing. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the topic and I'm very happy to share any experience. So throughout the career history, I worked starting from uh, well-established international companies like Glaxo, uh, Abbott, uh, and then move on to uh, the uh, sequencing industry like uh, Illumina, and recently worked at the Grill, this uh, uh, spin-off from uh, Illumina. Um, so after Grill, I actually moved to China. So I worked first in Shanghai uh, for a company called Labway, uh, which is an um, uh, independent clinical lab. Uh, in a way, it's like uh, uh, Quest Diagnostics or LabCorp here in the US. But uh, in China, as uh, the healthcare industry is uh, emerging to be um, privatized, to be uh, using modernized facilities, uh, so the um, uh, independent lab is um, not comparable yet to, uh, uh, to that scale. So one of my mission was to help introduce testing menus, uh, lab management from the US to China. And most recently, um, I just moved to join a company in Shenzhen, uh, acting as the chief medical officer for that company. Uh, we are specializing in uh, cancer early detection using uh, a liquid biopsy method. So that's my current role. And also I spend half of my time here in the Bay Area as my family still lives here. I still consider myself to be San Francisco Bay based person. Uh, working on uh, funding small uh, early stage companies in the medical device space. Uh, that's, uh, in that role, we have something called Gulf Capital. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, with uh, funding to support seed stage companies. So that's my background. And uh, again, be very happy to discuss any uh, topic on, on, on these related issues. Sequencing. Uh Technology, the genome genome sequencing, yeah. The uh, the graph I put on there is the forever dropping, uh, you know, cost of uh, um, uh, sequencing and uh, DNA sequ sequencing, and uh, currently it's like way below Moore's uh, Moore's law. And BGI now offers a whole genome sequencing uh, service at less than 0.01 per megabase in, in 2018, so way, even way below the price uh, they draw there. So what, uh, uh, what do you guys see as, uh, you know, the, um, uh, uh, what's your requirement for uh, uh, genome sequencing and where the cost would be the best and, and uh, what's the quality would be, um, you know, for, you, for your application, for your <laughs> yeah, okay, I definitely want to, I can take that on first. Um, so I, I would think cost is definitely an issue, and also time spent on generating that data, analyzing that data. So the current uh, leading provider indeed is Illumina in this space. And uh, with that uh, uh, type of uh, parallel sequencing technology, uh, with the current platform, what I see as problem is indeed it's still pretty high cost. Uh, for operation and also the time, again, required. For our lab in China, for example, we uh, promise to deliver result to a physician within 14 days. Uh, it's two total weeks. And in that uh, 14 weeks, nearly eight to 10 days are actually spent on the actual sequencing machine part, as well as the data transferring. In the previous session, I remember people talking about uh, uh, actually, it's also uh, uh, Nibor from BGI talking about the, the shaping a terabyte of data on hard disk. So that's actually a situation I encounter a lot of uh, places uh, when you do, especially in our situation when we do ultra deep sequencing uh, on CTDNA. Uh, it's a huge amount of data, but for, for ours, it's not terabyte yet, luckily. So we could still use the cloud to transfer uh, but still, it's a it's a, a big endeavor. So I have to think the current sequencing technology definitely has room to improve, uh, either both in terms of uh, cost as well as in terms of uh, the data generated that can be uh, streamlined or reduced. So you would rank turnaround time and then cost and quality, or cost quality equal, or or quality first and. Uh, absolutely, yeah. anything need to be high quality, otherwise it's a uh, garbage. Um, yeah. 
So the situation, I would say, um, considering the second generation, the NGS with uh, the next generation, the real next next generation, the third generation, uh, what I see is the, on the third generation side, single molecule sequencing, it could potentially reduce the cost as well as accelerate the data generation. And but reduce. then the quality. But the quality, <laughs> right now, is an issue. So clearly, I think you asked the right question, uh, how to balance. So at this stage, I guess the industry has no choice but to use this uh, more mature and standard technology, which is uh, the second generation, the NGS, or being led by Illumina. Uh, I, I would uh, definitely hope this picture can be changed in the next couple of years, if it's uh, not five to six year time frame. Um, so that's my hope for this. Yeah, with, with our se new sequencing platform, MGI Seq, uh, we can actually deliver whole genome sequencing at 30x uh, uh, within two days. That's our current uh, term. Yeah, that's time. definitely yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes, I absolutely agree with what uh, was just said. Uh, so the cost is definitely an issue, and I think the biggest implication of it is the accessibility of people uh, to getting the genome sequenced hoping that uh, sooner or later we can figure out what uh, meaning we can extract from this information. Because uh, obviously it is very important to understand what genetic predisposition you may have. Uh, is there any sign of, let's say, Alzheimer's disease uh, coming along the line and things like that. So uh, currently insurance companies, they just don't see any benefits of p uh, paying, helping people to pay for whole genome sequencing because like, so what? Uh, but for people who really want to go and have this sequencing done so they can use the information how to improve their lifestyle, how to improve their healthy life uh, lifespan and things like that. So I would personally do it if, let's say, the cost of genome sequencing, you know, well, obviously I already did sequence it in the past, but if I was a customer from the outside, I would definitely, so $1,000 is even, I would say, too high. And second, uh, so if, it, if this is a one-time assay, you know, maybe you can uh, save some money and go do a sequencing of your genome once. But if you are talking about single-cell analysis, and I think uh, this is where the area is moving now, we need to understand what is happening with the body in real time, and you don't necessarily know what you are looking for. And this is what, for example, Cancer Mouchon is about. And people are sequencing the samples collected 20, 25 years ago, trying to identify predictive biomarkers of disease uh, popping up, let's say, 10, 15 years from the uh, time of collection. In order to streamline this, uh, technology definitely has to meet the expectation uh, to be cost efficient and provide sufficient quality to make sure that we are not generating false results and at the same time uh, what we are detecting actually makes sense. So data analysis obviously is a very big concern. So all this artificial intelligence data storage, we're generating obviously way too much data we can process right now, but I think this is the area which is growing at the highest speed right now, and I think we'll get there. Um, I think that's a good question. So as a customer, you know, there's nothing we can do about it, right? So cheaper, faster, better is definitely the way to go. So and more competition in go, this space is go good Illumina, go BGI, right? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to just just talk about you know the kind of stuff that, uh, that some of our companies are doing, which is I would say third and fourth generation sequencing. That is, what are we talking about? That is, you know, uh, uh, sequencing at a three D kind of sense, right? So you want to know not only you want to know how long you know your, your you know what mutations you have, you also want to know where are those mutations in the tissue in a 3D situation? And uh, so, so at Centrillion, we're building a gene chip that allows you to do that, to you know, slice your tissue and, and do, uh, to understand where the, the mutations are coming from and which genes are being expressed where, uh, not only which uh, part of the tissue, but which cell type, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I would say, I mean, this, this field is, is, is moving. Um, obviously, BGI and Illumina are are uh, uh, making it cheaper, faster, better for everybody. Uh, large data, more accurate data, longer reads, et cetera, et cetera. But there are also lots of other companies that are going the other direction, that is to, to make it more granular, make the sequence information more useful. Uh, in you know, third generation sequence, for example, you, you're, you should be resolved a lot of the you know, HLA regions, a lot of the more complex regions, and, and from um, from a pure technology point of view, uh, that's, uh, that's 
where I see the next uh, uh, direction is. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the next question I'll ask, um, I'll put up a very superficial slides. Uh, you, you can see those uh, uh, diagrams very often on uh, on, uh, uh, um, uh, on internet is like precision medicine, how it works, it seems to be really straightforward. You sequence the patient's RNA or whole exome or, or um, um, potentially whole genome uh, if they can uh, afford it and then figure out what's their genetic uh, you know, profiling and then give the, uh, give the drugs to them. So what do you think, uh, you know, what's your um, unique understanding about uh, precision medicine and what do you think you and the, uh, your company uh, is contributing in this space? <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, uh, precision medicine uh, is, a, is a concept or term being coined in recent years. Leading this uh, uh, kind of evolution is really initially in the, towards the end of 1990s, there is a concept called personalized medicine. And I was uh, involved at Glaxo, and at that time we were trying, uh, Glaxo doesn't yet in embrace that idea. So I, uh, from there, I moved on to a biotech company called Genesis Pharmaceuticals. And there, we actually focus on our company's logo was about personalized medicine in 1990s. So what we were doing there was thinking about eventually everybody from baby, uh, as soon as you born, the baby was born, we will generate all of the genetic information and put that onto a, a business card size of uh, information like a credit card the person could carry all the time in his or her wallet and uh, every medical care facilities can quickly reading that information and do a lot of drug prescription. Uh, that concept was pretty early on and the company, uh, we did manage to do a couple of things which were very uh, significant. One of them was uh, generating a uh, haplotype uh, based on single polymorphism uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism using a uh, uh, in silico method, we infer all of the facing uh, for more than 8,000 genes. So, which is a very big endeavor and very useful for the early stage drug discovery process. That was one of the contribution. And then we did something else on actually using this clinically. So, we sequenced five long QT genes. And that will give physician the actual guidance about how to treat a familial uh, cardiac arrhythmia patient, especially the, in the pedi pediatric practice. And there, the significance for those five genes are really, for lung QT syndrome, you have three types of them. One, lung QT1 uh, caused the intervention. Let, let's just talk about the intervention part. For lung QT1, really, you could prescribe better beta blocker, which is a very cheap um, uh, prescription medicine. And then for type two, the only thing you need to do is actually avoid some of the triggers, environmental uh, uh, factors. So lifestyle change will make it work. Patients should not do any exercise, fit, you know, sudden exercise, uh, like swimming and uh, stuff like that. And then for type three lung QT, Actually, you have to do some very significant intervention, which is the implantation of the ICD device, which is costly, uh, on general, it's about 30,000 US dollars. So you can see, knowing the genetic information, it's so critical in treating this type of patient. And that was uh, a product I led to develop at that company and launched uh, in the early 2000. And then, the other product we developed was actually using that similar concept about pharmacogenetics to try to uh, target the population who should be prescribed a given drug. We worked on the drug in, uh, a drug in the major depressive disorder area uh, called Velazodone, and even till the US FDA approved the drug in 2009, and the, the, the asset was acquired by uh, Forest Lab in New York. So, just using that as an example, uh, you can see over the last two dec decades, this personalized medicine concept has been actually experimented and used. Nowadays, on the US uh, uh, FDA side, you can find all of the drugs with uh, labeling containing pharmacogenetics information. Essentially, um, by testing the uh, P450 
family of the genes, which are the major metabolizer for, for drugs. And then this is, as uh, you, you, you put it, uh, during the Obama administration, um, they launched this whole um, the concept about uh, precision medicine. And this round, I see one of the major significance actually are in the oncology area, which is a major deliberating uh, hurdle for, for the humanity right now. Um, and there, this concept is well adopted and well rooted in a way uh, the, the targeted therapy is available, especially considering uh, lung, uh, lung cancer. So I, I think everybody these days can benefit and uh, can uh, talk about precision medicine just like a, a routine word in our daily life. And that should be further uh, uh, developed. And I, I can see this in the next 10 years uh, with uh, what people are doing, especially with uh, uh, the liquid biopsy technology. I have to imagine we are going to be having a lot of precision in dealing with uh, the patient management in oncology first and then the other disease area as well. Uh, so obviously next generation sequencing is a very powerful and valuable tool uh, to say, identify genetic makeup and uh, maybe make some predictions how people will respond to drugs and uh, what diseases they may encounter uh, during their lives. But I think this time we already come uh, to the understanding that just genetic analysis is not enough. We really need to understand uh, what is happening in the body, and as you all know Leroy Hood and the work he is doing, uh, such as, for example, looking at metabolome, looking at uh, gut microbiome, looking at genomic profile, looking at expression profiling, uh, working uh, with life coaches, people actually tell other people how to change their lifestyle, and they see changes which are happening, that people getting they're feeling better and things like that. So to me, uh, this is a better definition of precision medicine and uh, actually the set of tools which you have to use to really make this beneficial to people is actually much wider than just NGS. So of course NGS plays a very important role, but it's not the only one. Uh, second, uh, which I want to mention is that uh, precision medicine is not necessarily uh, tells you what you will benefit from, but it may also tell you what you definitely will not. So for example, mutation in certain genes, uh, they just clearly say that this patient is not going to benefit from these drugs and the patient should be taken from it uh, just to avoid uh, undesirable side effects with essentially no benefit. And this is also part of precision medicine, just uh, it is saving money, it is saving, let's say, the side effects and things like that. And the third is uh, there is no magic bullets which you can come up with using precision medicine approach. Uh, so, for example, if you talk about managing cancer, it is a continuously evolving disease. And even if you have indication that, yes, this drug will work and likely patient will benefit from it, uh, probably to a certain extent, but then other clones can emerge and eventually kill the patient. And so we actually we take one shot and we believe it will help and it will take care of it. Well, in case of bacteria, when you have antibiotic which will kill this bacteria, yes, but definitely not in case of cancer. So these are the limitations which I think we all understand now, and I think the whole area is working towards solving them. Yeah, I, I think f from my perspective, you know, precision medicine started with sort of this companion diag diagnostics, right, that, that you guys talked about, uh, you know, garden health, um, foundation medicine, you know, genomic health, et cetera. Uh, you know, what drug you should or shouldn't use with certain mutations. But I think it is moving in a very promising direction. That is, uh, you know, we heard about the, this new antigen phenomena, right? So uh, completely brand new, customized um, treatment methods for cancer, very patient-specific. It's completely dependent on uh, very deep sequencing and understanding some of the the very unique signatures of um, of cancer cells, so you can design customized uh, immunotherapies. Uh, this could be a huge breakthrough for cancer therapy, and it's complete, completely individualized. So th I think this is where um, personalized medicine is moving toward. But but you know we don't actually you know com coming to sort of personalized genomic information. We don't have to limit it to medicine. We actually have a company that will sequence your DNA and tell you what cosmetics to use. <laughs> Can you believe that? Not very accurate yet. There are a few, actually. But they're getting there, right? They, they do have, you know, they tell you, you know, what vitamins to take, 
uh, what cosmetics to use. It's pretty good, but you know, still not there yet, but with more time and more data, and they are getting better. So, so this sort of precision genetic information is here, and it doesn't have to be limited to medicine. Yeah, so you basically, you have a purple mutation, you take a purple drug and you're cured. And you have a red mutation, you take a red drug and you're cured, right? So, so actually personal med personalized medicine indicates that you're creating a particular um, uh, 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 treatment for uh, individual uh, patient. I think that cannot be achieved uh, to date until we, you know, uh, really large scaling, you know, uh, uh, bring the immunotherapy into large scale. You're really using patients' own immune um, information and immune cells and uh, blood cells to treat themselves, right? And that is really pricey and <laughs> for now, and it's currently not available. So um, let's see, um, what do you see as a current challenges for precision medicine. Let's see if our audience, uh, um, luckily we didn't lose too much. Uh, if we have one third uh, of the audience as uh, from the investor, uh, uh, pretty much we have one already, one quarter as from the investor uh, uh, you know, uh, perspective and one third from uh, entrepreneur perspective. So where do you see uh, the opportunities are for the entrepreneurs and uh, for the investors to, you know, pull their money to help those challenges. Where, where are the opportunities you see at the next five years? Yeah, uh, I guess I can get started again. Uh, since I, we are both hands, uh, on one end, I'm entrepreneur right now. Uh, on that, uh, with that company, we are doing the um, early detection for cancer. Uh, using uh, liquid biopsy method. And then on the other end, I'm also evaluating opportunities uh, to try to invest uh, on the early stage, again, in the uh, same sector, mostly the medical device sector. Um, so I would see here, we, we definitely have uh, the situation, the typical situation. Uh, there are challenges and there are huge opportunities. Uh, first of all, I have to talk to the opportunity side. I think precision medicine clearly it's going to be the next uh, um, real revolution for the practice of health care. Uh, we see that being gradually adopted over the last, tw last two decades. We talk about the drug prescription, we talk about the patient management, uh, we talk about the individualized therapy uh, using the immune systems of uh, an individual. So I would see clearly that will be more and more and more broadly applied to health care in the next decade, clearly, and will be accelerated. Uh, you, you can see this whole thing, the immunotherapy uh, was very clearly a, a very good, uh, good uh, example. Uh, actually, that got started more than 10 years ago. It's uh, probably towards the end of 1990s again. There is a therapy for prostate cancer using this similar concept. Uh, I can't remember the company's name. It's a Seattle company. And even till they, they, they got FDA approved of their product. But unfortunately, it's so expensive and it's so individualized. So it doesn't get adopted widely. Uh, but nowadays, if you talk about CAR T therapy, you're talking about uh, those kind of uh, um, uh, very individualized therapy. It's indeed that the continuation of that model. And this time, it's simply broadly accepted, not only in a particular US region, it's worldwide being adopted nowadays. So I think clearly, uh, as a humanity, we are really at this junction of using the current information, both generated by the tumor biology, molecular biology, uh, that will benefit the, the actual healthcare practice. So that's really the opportunity. The challenge is typical as well. I would uh, really see on one end, it's really lacking of the information. Conducting the clinical trials, I think Lana just mentioned a moment ago, uh, how much it costs, how long it takes. So I think all of those are still um, the same picture. But there are revolutionary practice in that field as well. Uh, there are a couple of, um, when I ran clinical trials at Grail, we encountered a provider which actually uh, is called 37 something. Uh, why it's called 37? I asked them why you have this name. 
but their name is just saying this is going to be the, the regular practice, just like your normal body temperature is 37. So they are thinking the clinical trial should be done in a more innovative way. And their innovative way is actually the participant of the clinical trial doesn't need to go to that site. Uh, like we currently practice, like you, you need to do this at MSK, MD Anderson, or that type of, uh, you know, hospitals or in China, the Sanyo or the Xiangya. So they don't need to have the patient to the site, but rather the sponsor or through their CRO, like 37, to send a mobile nurse to visit them at their location. Or they can be drawn, the blood can be drawn at the uh, Quest lab or LabCorp lab and sent to the central lab to, to be analyzed. So uh, all of those innovations, uh, as well as um, uh, there, are, there are new EMR, EHR mining uh, companies that will help to also to accelerate the patient selection phase. So I think clinical trials will be revolutionized as well. So accelerate the speed. Uh, those are traditional challenges, but they will uh, be, uh, I think the, 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 the new innovation will help. And then the next hurdle is indeed the regulation, the regulatory agencies. Um, but we see at the current administration in the US actually that start to break through. Last year in 2017, we saw two um, medical devices being approved by the US FDA, which involves several hundreds of gene markers, which is uh, totally unexpected or totally exceptional because Traditionally, FDA typically doesn't really approve uh, NGS or this type of product that quickly. But last year, we saw two of them. So it's a very, very uh, encouraging. And I think on the challenge side, probably since uh, barriers start to break down as well. So I'm very optimistic about the precision medicine to be quickly adopted in the next decade. Yeah, there is also this FDA uh, update on uh, if you are referring to, uh, you know, gene wire or clean wire, those data, you don't need to re-validate uh, your, right. your data. Right. There's so a new guideline from also, FDA on that yeah, as well. Right, yes. Right, right. Yeah, we're, we're yeah, encouraging progress. also accelerated progress. The, yes. the treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I just want to add a few things. Uh, so, for example, we are all generating data, and this is what the whole area is doing now. But what I really want to uh, bring attention to is that the quality of, of this data should be good. Because otherwise, we'll be generating a bunch of data. If it is misleading information, then we'll make wrong decisions now, and our descendants will never figure out what exactly happened. I've seen this uh, as a lab scientist, and I just want to point this out, this is very important, not just move as fast as you can, but also uh, be responsible for the data you're generating. Mm -hmm. uh, second, I would definitely want to mention that uh, precision medicine, we can try to understand as much as we can, but we will never understand how nature uh, exists, uh, what other mechanisms are making things work. And uh, immunotherapies uh, definitely have a breakthrough potential here because we don't actually know exactly how this works, but it just does. And what we are doing is we are harnessing the nature's power and force uh, to fight, actually, and we are putting it uh, you know, as one of our tools, or um, I would say leading force, uh, to tackle the problem which we cannot, uh, no matter how smart we think we are. And the third item, which I think is, um, well, obviously regulations are a hurdle, but uh, honestly, how do you validate uh, these assumptions? How do you validate these conclusions? Uh, this is what uh, we were discussing at FDA like 10 years ago. Uh, these mouse models, uh, let's say cell culture models, they are inadequate to translate findings to uh, humans. And so, for example, there was a very good example. So let's say like mouse model fail and the drug was killed, but actually it would have been a fitted human and the uh, other way around. So let's say it passed all the clinical trials until it uh, hit human clinical trials and the drug uh, turns out to be very toxic. So still there is a big need to have these models uh, to actually turn around our validation as fast as we can. I think this could be one of the limiting factors right now. So, I mean, as far as the direction, from my perspective, um, you know, we've been sort of trying to fight cancer for a very, very long time, right? So war on cancer, the moonshot, lots of names for it. Um, but I think, I think we're pretty close now. I mean, we are about as close as I can see of actually finding a solution to cancer. Um, 
I, I don't know how long it might take, but, but the, the fact that you know, we are able to understand some of the very rare transcripts in the cancer cell, understand how, how they become cancer cell, and, and, and you know, some of these things I mentioned, you know, the new antigen approach, for example, is, is a good example of it. Um, I mean, as, 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 I mean, as an investor, you have to look at that, right? I mean, I mean there, if, if that approach uh, works, uh, there will be a few billion dollar companies. Um, and, and more importantly, we will save lives. We, we actually, we have an opportunity um, very, in a very long time to actually cure, to have a cure, right? So that, that's, that's, that's on one side. On the other side, I actually, I really like the consumer part of it very much. And uh, because we, so, we know so little about ourselves when you think about it, right? Um, so, so there's a lot to be learned there and there's a lot of business opportunities there as well. Excellent. I, I guess the cancer part uh, really lead to my next question. Uh, I hope I don't turn James down. Uh, that there is a recent uh, study, and actually it was argued at AACR conference was uh, um, in 2018, 15% of uh, um, six, 600,000 U.S. cancer patients was treated by a particular, you know, so-called precision or, uh, or, or uh, genetic profiled uh, drug, and only 6% of them likely benefited. And among them, many of them, they, they actually relapse in the next few years. So that really, you know, has a big gap on how we say precision medicine, everybody, you know, has a, a disease, well, get a particular drug um, from that expedition to <laughs> where we are now. So. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? <laughs> yeah, personally, I uh, I think uh, I'm definitely op remain optimistic. <laughs> Maybe not as Jim. Uh, not I, I. don't know when this will be curable, uh, but I definitely think it can be managed and the chronic disease very soon. It won't be that lethal uh, as it is. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the recent cancer statistics. Um, the trend is for most of the uh, type of cancers, the survival rate is actually increasing uh, uh, very significantly. So we are doing a great job in terms of uh, uh, moving towards the right direction to manage uh, cancer as a disease. Uh, but I, I definitely agree also the challenges being put up there. Um, it's just like, uh, I would say those are localized situation. Uh, in a way, if you look at the, over the history, or uh, over um, the perspective of projecting next few years, I think the, the setback or any issues being brought up uh, overall uh, localized issues. Uh, just like I mentioned that uh, early on, there was uh, personalized therapy being clearly developed and approved, yet it wasn't adopted widely. Uh, so that type of situation occurs, and in this situation, I would imagine a couple of scientific possibilities are behind the scene uh, causing those kind of uh, uh, issues. And then also you have the type of technology limitations as uh, you can all appreciate uh, very recent high visibility reports, scientific reports, talking about uh, using two different labs of uh, genetic testing result. They got totally different, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, test reports. So that, that does happen uh, at this moment. I think that just speaks to the complexity we are facing, but that doesn't really deter us from using this information or using it better, or understand it, taking the lesson learned and move forward uh, to address those issues like uh, tumor, the uh, cancer heterogeneity issue, like the test limitation of being using a single method may be an issue, then you can comp complement with just like uh, Nikolai just mentioned, possibly going to uh, uh, other type of information as well as uh, Jim talked about the 3D possibility of profiling. Uh, I think all of those will clearly help um, uh, in the next uh, few years, we will see better uh, medicine being developed using uh, precision medicine. Uh, yes, definitely, I'm optimistic about the future of precision medicine. 
and uh, actually I just uh, I want to ask people who are working in RNA area, who is looking with exosomes, who is looking at methylation, like epigenetic uh, modifications. Usually people are trying to make, uh, let's say, their names, money, and say, we found unique technology which can detect cancer, any cancer at any stage because of methylation profiling. It doesn't work like this. And we just need to combine the forces and look at other genomic alterations which are, are present there, and it can be... Uh, uh, all what I just said and maybe something else which you don't know yet. Uh, definitely uh, precision medicine which we are doing, how we understand it now, is like we're really hoping that we take uh, this one drug and this one drug will change the outcome of the patient. Uh, not necessarily. So um, as uh, we already mentioned today, it can be, so cancer, for example, is a good example of a disease which most likely will have to be managed as chronic disease with all our drugs that you currently have available. But on the other hand, maybe you can manage it until a certain point uh, when tumor accumulates enough mutations and then becomes uh, attackable by immune system. Uh, so at this time, uh, maybe you use precision medicine approach until the moment you think you can actually turn immune system of the body to, to fight it for you, right? So precision medicine doesn't have to cure the disease from start to finish. It's just a tool uh, to actually improve patient outcome and be um, uh, your help in actually uh, curing and managing these diseases. Any good is better than nothing. <laughs> yes, it's just I believe we need to be smart about what we're doing and not putting uh, one, uh, one, our last buck in a single bucket. I think it's the combination of uh, many things. Yeah, I, I'm completely optimistic. Uh, if only sequencing can be, uh, can take no time and, and free. <laughs> <laughs> it will become free <laughs> soon. Um, so, great. Uh, okay, so then um, I feel so optimistic now. Uh, we're right here on time. Um, so the last one, last question I have to the panelists. Uh, they all say, what do you see on science fiction movies and films and will become into reality in the next 10, 20 years? So I uh, invite our panelists and also our audience to use the wildest creativity to imagine you know, what will be happening in the precision medicine space and in the new, especially in the new area of, let's say, we have all the immunotherapy uh, in place and we have healthy, <laughs> healthy life and we can live over and over again or what? <laughs> What's your... Yeah, uh, oh, I'm not that kind of imaginative person. Or I didn't read much scientific f science fictions. But um, the, the company I worked for previously, as mentioned, Grail, indeed, it's based on one of those scientific imagination, uh, Holy Grail. So if we can indeed uh, make it happen, I, I would think this Holy Grail will clearly improve uh, the hu human uh, life expectancy in the sense we can reduce the mortality caused by uh, different cancers. Uh, as you all know, cancer can be, in a way, for some cancer, it can be cured right now. Indeed, uh, if you look at the, some of the reports, uh, very clearly in the GI tract, um, you know, the gastric cancer, the colorectal cancer, if you can find them early, like stage one, uh, indeed, by resection, by surgical resection, the five-year survival rate usually uh, above 90%, so it's very, very good. But if you find them late at stage four, it becomes very decimal. Uh, it's only 10 or 20% survival rate for five years. So clearly, early detection is really the key. And that's why this grail thing, the hearty grail imagination, is so p applicable and so important and uh, draw my attention to it and now I'm uh, continuing doing that with this company in Shenzhen called uh, Venomics. So there are many other players doing this same, similar things as well. So I definitely hope and I definitely think uh, eventually those scientific science fiction will become true. Excellent. Uh, that was a very tough question because I don't remember when I watched sci-fi movie last time. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely cannot, uh, don't have that kind of imagination. But. <laughs> Uh, definitely, I believe that we are not at the limit of sensing technologies uh, which we are developing, right? So look at all these nanopore uh, sequencing techno uh, sensing technologies, right? 
And so these nanopores, they're not necessarily have the only application for next generation sequencing. It's just, it's the best and the hardest, and that's why everybody's doing NGS, but honestly, uh, if you think about it, I don't see any fundamental limitations to d detect other analytes, or maybe detecting amino acid sequence of a protein, because you just need to find a way how to modify the pore, and you have, let's say, protein sequencer uh, without limitation for the length of protein which you can sequence. And it's just, so look at these semiconductor uh, technologies which are uh, being, you know, created, being built. Look at our ability to process data. There are these processors which allow you to analyze sequencing data in minutes instead of days, right? So I think we just uh, only starting, we are at the beginning at the, exp ex at the exponent and it will be just amazing in the next 10 years. I also noticed that uh, those technology, so when I was growing up, uh, so technology was changing very slowly. So for example, my parents were watching TV, which I was watching, which was black and white, right? Until I got, I don't know, like 15 years old, then color TVs, they uh, came to the market. Now these days, I cannot even keep up with how fast technologies are changing, all these smartphones, you know, iOS, Androids, things like that. So technologies are changing much more rapidly, and this is a very good sign of accelerating uh, in our ability to engineer and design new technologies, and it is only a matter of time when we find the application for them. Great. I, you, I think you're doing great. What was the question? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's your, uh, uh, I guess, perspective in, in um, uh, just use your imagination on what could be happening? Oh, oh, in, in, terms, like 10 in, years. in terms of precision medicine? Yeah. Oh, I, I this think. new era of precision sure, medicine, sure. you know? Sure. I mean, I, you know, I, it, first of all, I mean, I, 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 do believe, I, I do believe we're pretty close to a real solution to cancer, right? Maybe not all type of cancer, you know, some type of cancer, right? Uh, that, that, that's one. Uh, so anyone who are associated with those companies will be very rich. <laughs> so you invest in those companies. <laughs> And secondly, I say the current sequencing technology has a lot, has a, has a lot to play. To, well, I mean, I would say the current sequencing technology with the short, re short reads has a lot of issues, I would say, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but the third generation one, you know, the single molecule one doesn't quite work as well, and I'm feeling, you know, there are a lot of still mysteries in the genome that don't, we don't understand yet. I, I'm, I'm very positive of that, that uh, uh, if we sequence the genome in the right way, or, or, or even the microbiome in the right way, we'll find very interesting, um, we'll have very interesting discoveries. Um, can, you know, uh, the, the human, human, I mean, I'm a biologist, right? I mean, I read this stuff sometimes. The human to human genome variation is much bigger than we anticipated ever. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the, it's some of the regions that are different between people that are very hard to uncover using current technology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I look forward to a day where we can sequence the genome from one end to the other, not to cut up the genome at 300 base pair at a time and, and try to piece it together using computers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or, or even read it, you know, uh, 10 KB, KB at a time, right? That may not even be good enough. So uh, I hope someone develop a technology, and we're trying, uh, that you can actually read this book, this book of life <laughs> from chapter one all the way to the end, rather than you know shred up the book, right? That's the current approach, and then try to piece it to get together with the computer. I think we're missing a lot. We yeah. don't know what we don't know right now yeah, yeah, yeah. in the in the yeah. genome. Yeah. So I look forward to a day where we can say, "Aha, th that chapter is completely missing," you know, in the human genome. I don't know what that is. Yeah, that 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 is spot on. You just said what I wanted to say. We know what we don't know, but we don't know what we don't know. 
Um, and, and actually, on that uh, topic, uh, we do have a long fragment read technology currently releasing uh, that is uh, based on uh, actually leveraging the accuracy of short reads and as well as maintaining long fragment context. So we have 50 KB long fragment. Uh, I read your slides. The gene sequencing is so cheap. So I just wonder, uh, do you have any data support to show what's the relationship between the bad gene and the cancer? For example, you sequence the gene of a cancer cell and sequence the gene of normal size and compare and to find the difference. So you can imagine this gene, that gene might be related to this kind of a cancer. Do you have any uh, job done, any data support? Uh, this relationship. Sorry, I, uh, well, yeah, sure. Sure. Cool. So, <laughs> so it's supported by a lot of data. It's not just one individual, right? Uh, example, so you sequence, uh, you sequence, you get like uh, what Naibo uh, mentioned. So, so you sequence the tumor tissue. You you have the tumor profiling, and then you sequ you sequence the blood um, cells or the Plus cells uh, uh, to get the normal uh, genomic uh, profiling, and then you compare those two, uh, you know, uh, genetic profile to get the unique cancer uh, uh, signature for individual patient. But most of the time, those uh, well, um, I guess we have a. Uh, advance our knowledge quite a bit in the last few years, and we know um, the, where those signatures uh, are mostly coming from, and we are looking for those particular targets. But then again, we don't know what we don't know, so there are particular, um, uh, you know, particular area we could be missing uh, uh, yeah, in our you, current give analysis. You example. Like a cancer cell is a major cancer in China, and a small cell cancer is uh, most uh, fatal. So if you take a small uh, cell cancer cell, sequence the gene, and they take uh, the normal uh, long cell, stem cell to sequence the gene, you can find the difference or you cannot. You, you have body have done. This is so common uh, disease. Yes, yeah, so small cell lung cancer you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for all of your insight. So uh, currently, most of the precision medicine are used in the, the oncology field. Uh, so what, uh, what are about in, uh, let's say, uh, for the metabolic syndrome field? Uh, a lot of such diseases are affected not only by the gene uh, uh, genetic uh, factor, but also uh, environmental factor. So it's really a whole body, the, the, the big system, every from the head to the feet to the gut, every uh, places have, have a role. So do you really think uh, uh, precision medicine also have a bigger, bigger role in the, the, the treatment of the, the uh, metabolism or metabolic syndrome in future? Yeah, I, I definitely can talk about my own uh, career experience about that. And first of all, I want to also address the other question raised over there. Uh, I think uh, probably you speak to talking about two, two there, there are two scientific methodologies to address the question you raised. On one end, it's something called association studies. So typically what we do is, uh, if you use the term, it's called uh, GWAS, whole genome. Uh, association studies, and that gave us a lot of information about through the patient population with uh, 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 the phenotypes and the genotype, the genetics, we can find what region or what variations are associated with the phenotype. Like uh, if you're talking about non-small cell lung cancer situation, um, it has its particularities, and that can be also discovered that way. But currently though, there's not much therapies you can uh, customize or prescribe to this type of patients, unfortunately. So they have to use off-label medicine right now. That, that's one type of study to use. Another one is a kind of a, a typical, the cohort or control studies, uh, like what right now we are doing. For example, in this GRIL trial, we were doing CCGA trial. We have a, a, a targeted 15,000 patients. And in that, we have a ratio set up to be 
70% per of them need to be uh, a cancerous patients so with one of those 20 very common cancers. And then the other 30% are actually non-cancerous patients. They can have a cardio cardiovascular disease or arthritis or any other disease, but they should not have cancer. So then we will compile, compare them to do the genetic profiling. So those are two different methodologies to give us uh, the detection about the signal. And once we have the signal, we can use that to uh, prescribe to the person management, uh, the precision medicine management. So hopefully that gave you some answer. But unfortunately, there is no medicine for every indication or every situation. You, you have to understand that as well. So back to the question this lady raised. Uh, in my early career, uh, again in the 1990s, indeed we did one trial on the metabolic disease area. Uh, the trial called the strains. So what we did there was, uh, uh, man, so it's a, it's a, it's a, again it's a familiar situation. So clearly there's a genetic components to it. Uh, it's a hypercholesterolemia management situation. It's one type of uh, metabolic uh, disorder. And there we found genetic markers as well. So it is possible to find markers. But unfortunately, at that time, the marker was so such a common phenotype, it's uh, so, um, so difficult to, to address. Uh, basically, I think somebody mentioned prob probably at the previous panel about the nature. <laughs> so the, the nature actually has, a, the nature selection has its own power in the phenotype uh, given individual we express. So some of those metabolic uh, uh, situations, they actually have a protective advantage to the individual in a given environment. So therefore, the genetic and the pin is very complex. So what we found there is uh, more than 100 genetic markers to be associated. And it was unpractical at that time to make a, a test for that type of uh, a very complex phenotype. But I, I am sure today with uh, uh, if we spend efforts to it, uh, like precision, uh, precision medicine currently being applied to oncology, I'm sure we will find applicable situations for cardiovascular or metabolic disorders, um, simply because there's not enough effort, scientific efforts, I think, right now. But it's, uh, it's uh, applicable, this type of uh, uh, scientific principle. I have a question. So I want to ask the panelists about the uh, scalability of these personalized immunotherapies, right? Like, for example, like um, Novartis had their uh, CAR-T approved, right, the first time. And the Q1 2018, they only made $13 million in revenue. So that's like 30 patients, right? So are you guys aware of any sort of disruptive new technology that could kind of scale um, in terms of the personalized aspect of the uh, immuno IO field? Uh, well, I, I just uh, uh, want to say a few words because we had this kind of discussion with uh, Juno and Immune Design uh, last year. So, of course, let's say targeting like uh, some C like CD19, you know, on the, let's say, cancer cell, that would be a universal marker. And so what you need to worry about is, let's say, uh, compatibility, and that's it, right? So you have a certain target. So what this means is you can have vector designed uh, in one way, which goes in T cells of different patients, right? Uh, there are companies which have vectors which are much more complex and they are targeting five, six, so they're expressing five, six antigens. And the question which, so they came to FDA and FDA asked them, how do you characterize the population? How many of uh, your cells, vector cells, they have five, how many of them have six, how many of them have one? What is the effect of each of them, right? So they are still trying to say, okay, so these receptors, they are present in cancer cells, that's what we want to uh, attack and we can try to make our manufacturing process as uniform as possible. And if they could, uh, let's say the vector uh, structure doesn't change, manufacturing process doesn't change, what changes is the donor, is the source of T cells, uh, then I think this can continue actually pretty well. It's just uh, it is a matter of uh, adopting this and accepting that as a new way of therapy. In ideal case, and uh, so as we know, uh, for example, CAR T's or TCR T's, they don't work on solid tumors, right? So the only hope you should currently have is TILS, uh, right? Uh, so these are slightly different technologies, and I think 
uh, it's just a matter of uh, coming up with a unique biomarker which you can find on the tumor. And so the talk which we uh, heard today uh, about new antigens and being able to predict uh, what new antigens will be actually a signature of the tumor which then can be attacked and hopefully find something uh, which is common, not necessarily, uh, let's say, in this particular type of cancer, but maybe for cancer with this particular type of mutation. So in this case, I think that's one of the ways uh, to scale it up. There, there is a molecule out there that works with CAR-T. Um, it actually has not been issued in the market yet, but it is a it's a SAG super antigen, and it binds to the 5T4 receptor, and it does work. Um, also, in terms of uh, future technologies, just as a matter of reference, I'm curious, right now, Typically, when you, have a, when you have a new drug, you go to a tissue bank, UCSF has a large one, you, do, you look at all the genetic material out there in the tissue bank, then you do a bunch of calculations, then you do your lab tests, then you go to um, human trials. Given the nature of precision medicine and the nature of data, that we're collecting on genetic material and the predictive capabilities of that in terms of understanding different disease types. How do you see the database architecture changing for, for designing drugs, i.e., that if you have a very large understanding of the genetic makeup of different tissue types, the very large understanding of different genomes and biomarkers, how is that gonna change the database design of drugs? So, uh, so you're asking about the actual database design or is it the, the schematic uh, lab? Yeah. So, so I, I would think the clear um, you know, happens to be that I worked in the bioinformatics field in my early times. I indeed designed the database schema. Uh, so I would think the, the one of the challenge uh, really is uh, the interoperability. So you have uh, information coming from all different um, uh, data sources. So genomics is one part of it. And then you talk about the tissue back, that's typically the genomic part. But most critically though is the phenotype data. So nowadays I would think we, we probably encounter more problem on the phenotype side. Uh, the precision being not that precise there and that limits our ability to really draw conclusion uh, or derive useful information sometimes. So I, I would still view that as a major challenge, but uh, significant progresses are making are made there as well. Um, so I would imagine the whole database part will be more um, interoperable, uh, more uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we talk about that, in the aid of uh, drug discovery, I think that's one of the application area. And um, you know, uh, Lana and uh, her company talked about the natural language processing. We use that as well in our process uh, at Grail, um, as I mentioned, just for recruiting patient purpose at least. So the technologies are helping, are improving as well towards the goal. Not only we understand the molecular science or tumor itself better, we also have a we are enabled by better technologies these days. Uh, so I just want to add a little comment from the diagnostics uh, side. Uh, so for example, in some cases you may see uh, alterations which could tell that patient can actually benefit from two or more drugs. And the question is which one do you choose and which one do you use first? Uh, this question has not been resolved and to the best of my knowledge, people don't even understand how to approach that. On the same, at the same time, um, so we are betting on a single drug which will we use once and it will help, right? I don't think uh, we actually should be continue looking at this like that, and maybe the combination of drugs, maybe not even closely related drugs, but something which can sent, like sensitize, uh, you know, the tumor or disease which we are trying to treat, and something else uh, which actually can come and affect maybe other part of the workflow or uh, let's say like metabolic cycle, right? So the combination of these drugs maybe will work best. So for example, in uh, Chinese medicine, I actually feel very weird speaking about this. Uh, so they uh, usually, Chinese medicine works when you have three components of it, right? Do you want to talk about this? Uh, 
what it is, <laughs> right? it, yeah, because there is driver, there is governor, and there is uh, some, something else, something third one, which I forgot. Right? Only these three components, they work. So for example, all uh, attempts to find uh, what is the active compound in ginseng was never successful, because people are trying to isolate individual compounds, they test them one by one, no effect. Right, only the combination, and nobody knows because there are like ten thousand of different compounds there. So the synergy, uh, this combined effect by uh, different com uh, compounds on drugs, I mean that's one of the ways we should look at. Yeah, talking about the combination of drugs, I think that's clear. Uh, traditional Chinese medicine definitely is totally from that perspective. Well, Western medicine, we are based on the modern science, so we derive down to the actual uh, element as a component. But these days, we all know, in, for example, for infectious disease, HIV, cocktail treatment, that's a combination of different compounds into the same, uh, uh, same dose and the same regimen for the treatment. So we clearly see the, the merge of the, the concept, uh, different concepts coming together. Uh, in oncology, I think right now it's also this situation. For example, in non-small uh, non -small cell or lung cancer situation, nowadays we start to see that they are not using this concept of first line, second line, third line. They're rather doing testing and then they will apply the medicine uh, in a combinatory way as well. So those are uh, some indications about uh, you know, the East and West come together and hopefully to definitely benefit it. Uh, the human medicine. Complex biology and uh, complex uh, data. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, uh, as long as we know where the challenges are, we'll be, you know, game the head uh, uh, to the challenges. So with that, uh, I'll, yeah, thank everyone for your attention and close this session. Thank you. <laughs>